Hi, I'm Lee Kelso, host of the Health Call Live Radio Hour, and I'm glad you're here to learn more about the use of psychedelic drugs in the treatment of severe depression. Now, I've been reading an awful lot in the media lately about people reporting really great results using magic mushrooms, psilocybin, to treat depression. So I wanted to find out more about that and reached out to Dr. Gerard Santacora. He is with the Yale University Depression Research Program. Dr. I did you ever imagine that we would be talking about psilocybin? I mean, an organization as credible as Yale researching and talking about magic mushrooms? Uh, when I started in the field 30 years ago, it, it was at a point where it kind of hit the nadir of interest in those type of drugs and medications. Uh, but I think evidence developed over the past three decades has really brought it to the level of credibility again. I, I think it's it's appropriate to be studying it. I think some of the lay media has over um, glorified or over represented the potential benefit. We're, we're at the point where it's, it clearly is warranted study, but mm -hmm. that's what we're doing now. Good. So, yeah, I am seeing lots of reports of people saying they suffered uh, severe depression for much of their life. They have tried many different uh, drugs, traditional medications. It's not working. Uh, one or two doses of psilocybin and, and they feel great. Now, I understand there's, there's some positive selection bias at work there, but does that measure up with what you're seeing in research? So I, I think the data that are out and published are very early and are very promising. Um, the, the results do look very promising, and it's part of what got me interested. I'm not what would be considered a psychedelic researcher in, in any stretch of the word, but I think the data is strong enough to suggest there may be something there. But I do emphasize this is very early data. It, it mm -hmm. hasn't been held to the rigor of the classic randomized placebo-controlled trials that we typically do. So I came across some research that showed a 70% response rate. So patients who had met all the criteria for a major depressive disorder treated with psilocybin, 70% reported improvement in symptoms, and it was a lasting improvement. That's just dramatic. That That is quite amazing. And, and as I said, very exciting and very promising. The concern that we have to have and that we have to account for is what is the nonspecific effect or what some people would call the placebo effect of doing this. Uh, it's not uncommon to see rates well above 50 percent in trials for depression, um, especially when there's such high levels of expectancy. So mm -hmm. we really want to account for that and make sure that this is a true effect of the drug. The, the other interesting thing in most of these studies is it's not just the drug. The drug is given in the context of what's typically called set and setting, where there's very intense relationship with facilitators or therapists or uh, whatever you're, you're referring to the people that are with you over many hours. And that itself mm -hmm. can have a very strong impact. So it's hard to know, is it the medicine or is it all the other ancillary stuff? Or what we believe is there's some synergism between the two. Yeah, let me paint that picture for people who aren't following this as closely. Uh, so typically in the research that I have read, you're brought into a setting. Uh, you are usually typically laying down, uh, putting on some some form of a mask to, to block your eyesight. Uh, often there's music involved and there's somebody there as a guide to kind of get you through this process. So I see what you mean about it. it's a it's a formal structure. There's a lot of interaction and you would have a lot of expectation. Right. I went through a lot of effort to do this. So I want something on the other side. So I see how that could be a bias. I get that. Um, but the long term response to, to uh, psilocybin is really interesting. And you mentioned something just a moment ago. I think we need to talk a little bit more about and that is neuroplasticity. Can you tell me what that means to a guy who doesn't really know how the brain works? <laughs> so in the most general sense, if you think of neuroplasticity, it's talking about the ability of the brain to adapt to changes, and specifically in terms of how the, the cells in the brain are communicating and connecting. So it, that's the broadest, most general sense. It's the brain's ability to adapt to change. Now, um, that um, very, uh, at the more uh, 
basic level where you're uh, referring to this as um, uh, you know, in the terms of neurobiology, we talk about in terms of synaptic plasticity very commonly, which is actually the forming, the formation of new synapses that are actually allowing the cells to communicate with new, uh, new cells, or at least to have different connections to them, actual different branches of these dendrites that are being sent out. And then at the more uh, gross level, the larger level, seeing new circuits being reinforced. So which brain circuits are actually activated more. So it, it's, a, it's a process that runs all the way from the molecular level all the way up to the anatomical level that you, the brain can change to adapt to things. So there's some belief that psilocybin might be causing the brain, for lack of a better phrase, to rewire and restructure itself. And that might be part of the benefit. And, and that is something we're all very interested in. It's where a lot of the research is occurring right now. There's evidence suggesting that even the classical antidepressants, drugs like Prozac, have those effects at some level. Um, it, typically, it would take longer term exposure to them. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the magnitude of the effect may not be as great. But this is something that has, for the past 20 to 30 years, has been a prominent hypothesis in, in the mechanism of antidepressant action, that it's facilitating these adaptive changes in the brain. So tell me about the work that you're doing and, and what you think is the next big question we need to solve as we move closer to giving some serious look at psilocybin. For me, and it's where our work is uh, primarily involved, is doing the clinical trial research to actually convince ourselves that this is an effective antidepressant. I'm not quite there yet. I'm, as I said, I'm very enthusiastic, and I think the data that's out there is incredibly exciting, but it is not the high quality data that I would require. I'm a very skeptical scientist that, at heart to convince me that yes, this is in fact an antidepressant. I, I think we're, we're, we're getting there, but we have not reached that level of uh, certainty that I would feel that comfortable. So I, I'm a little careful not to put the cart before the horse. So before mm -hmm. we try to figure out how it works, I'd really like to figure out, does it work? So give me, uh, what are patients telling you? What's a typical patient response? So I, I you know, I have to be very careful how I say this because the trials that I'm involved in are randomized placebo control trials that haven't been opened. So I don't know what they're getting or not getting. So I want to be careful in, in how. But so let me explain that for the audience. So yes. an open trial, uh, so you're doing a placebo controlled trial. So you don't know whether the patients are getting the drug or something else. Correct. Okay. So, so I do want to be careful in talking about the specific effects. And in fact, most trials right now, since these are what's considered schedule one drugs, which means that uh, they're illegal, essentially. Yeah, yeah basically, they they have no medical use at right. this point. Um, so they typically have to be used in a way where it's under a research protocol to be done legally. But in general, the effects that people get from this typically range from um, having a what they would consider this period of enlightenment, saying that they're able to see the world in different ways to see their problems through different lenses uh, and, and they feel that they're able to change the way they think about things and, and have a completely different perspective. But on the other hand, there are people that say this was a very frightening, scary experience um, and you know they uh, it was unpleasant and you know, it ranges and that's a, a major reason why important to have people that are very familiar with this in the room with them, working with them, preparing them for it. So th this is not, uh, and, I, and I tell my patients, this is not like, well, why don't we try Prozac, where I, I can pretty much guarantee you that you're not going to have any major changes one way or the other. It's not going to be a terribly unpleasant experience, although even that can be unpleasant for some people. And it's probably not going to be something you take one pill in and you feel that your perspective in the world has changed. Um, but when we talk about drugs like psilocybin, you, you're really dealing with something that has a, a much more powerful immediate effect, but it can go either way. And, and we have to really make sure that the risk just 
quantify the potential benefits when we use treatments like this? Yeah. So in the in the Native American history and, uh, you know, in a lot of the uh, popular use of this, uh, there is that guided experience where there's somebody in the room with you, uh, almost a shaman uh, who kind of le a spirit spirit leader who kind of gets you through this process in, in case you go down that dark tunnel. Now, that's that's kind of a, a, a larger dose. The micro dosing, though, is real interesting. So this is the concept of people taking very small amounts, but on a frequent basis. And I've been reading that that people are saying it's it just kind of lifts their spirit, uh, more energy, more focus. Uh, does that match with what you, you understand this to be? So I have much less experience personally um, with uh, seeing people who have using microdosing of psilocybin or, or other uh, similar type drugs. I, I come back to Lee, the main thing is most treatments in medicine respond dramatically to nonspecific effects. It's similar with this. So people could be getting benefits, whether it's really related to the specific of the drug specific effects of the drug or all the other non-specific effects, it's really hard to know. Those non-specific effects are very powerful. I get it. So that's why you need to do the research. And but on the other hand, if I've got severe depression and I feel better after this therapy, whether it's the drug or it's not, does it really matter? Well, uh, and this is where it comes down to the risk benefit ratio. Yeah. And, you know, the, so if there's no risk to it and it, giving you some benefit that's fine but you have to balance the risk and, and is there a risk i mean what's is, are, is this an addictive drug is psilocybin going to do i become habitualized to it so th that's a debated question and, and the word addictive it has different meanings to different people so it, it is not the type of addictive drug that you would see with an opiate um, you know morphine, heroin, fentanyl, anything like that. So it doesn't have those type of physical uh, dependency type issues that we see with some of those other drugs like that. But we know it is a drug of abuse. So we know people will abuse it. We know there is a certain percentage of the population that will misuse it and, mm -hmm. and abuse it. We don't really know what percent of the population that is. We don't know if m more exposure to it will make more people likely to have that if we expose it to the many thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people, what percentage? I mean, these are all questions we really don't know the answer to. I mean, we know the extremes. We know it's not heroin. Um, it, but we also know that there is a potential for substance misuse. So I think we just have to be careful. So these studies that are being done, these phase two studies that are being done, are FDA registered. So now they're okay. standardized they're, product, standardized product, very you know, having the same rigor that any other pharmaceutical would have in terms of the quality and dosing and everything else. So, so these are the now these studies are coming out now. So we're going to have them in the near future. We don't have them to date, but they're getting there. OK, but if I'm hearing all the positive reports and I decide, well, I want to try this and the only product that's available to me is what I can get on the street, because I'm assuming I don't have access to the FDA controlled product, right? Well, clinicaltrials.gov is a great resource for people to find where trials are ongoing. And there are trials, there are several trials currently ongoing around the country. And I would strongly recommend anybody who is considering this, do it in a way that is done in a controlled uh, manner in, in a real rigorous uh, testing facility. So let's shift a little bit in, and spend just a few minutes talking about ketamine. So ketamine is a, a drug that's been approved by the FDA. It's been out there for years, was an anesthetic. So used, you know, you could probably wouldn't, but you could use it to knock me out so you can remove my tonsils, for example, just, just to explain how it has been used. But now we knew, now we've discovered that it seems to have other uses. And what are we finding there? So I, I think it's a great segue because ketamine really was the forerunner in many ways to this idea of psychedelic medications as therapeutics. And in, in 2019, it was actually approved for the treatment of treatment resistant depression and 2020 for the treatment of depression associated with suicidal ideation. So this is an idea of we took a drug that 
previously was thought of as an anesthetic and, and also a drug of abuse. Uh, it's commonly, or it was commonly used in rave parties for its effects on cognition and perception and, and misused in that sense. But it has gone through the rigorous trials all the way through and, and now has FDA approval. So we've seen a model that this can be done. I, that being said, I'm, I'm also always very cautious to remind people that we're right on the heels of the opiate epidemic. So when you have mm -hmm. these drugs that have potential abuse liability, so yeah, special K is is I think how it was known on the street, and um, so I can understand that that that's a big concern if you have people in a depressed community that are already maybe prone to addictive behaviors. You, that that's a challenge. Um, if I were to press you to look into the crystal ball and say which of these two do you think has the greatest promise for the broadest scope of people suffering depression? Well, I, I, for me, it's a pretty easy answer. Right now, we know that ketamine has passed the rigor, and we know the relative risk and safety of it. The idea of psilocybin is incredible, and, and the preliminary data really do look remarkable. Um, so the future, it's hard for me to say. And if, if the data continues to look as the early data do for psilocybin, I think it could be a, a dramatic uh, game-changing treatment for depression. But we're not there yet. Uh, so I'm very optimistic, very enthusiastic about it, but we have to continue to develop it responsibly. If I am suffering and currently in treatment with traditional therapeutics, um, is ketamine something I ought to be talking to my doctor about if, they, if he has not or he or she has not raised that as a, as a treatment option? Well, I would say at this point, ketamine has now sort of carved its way into the traditional. It, it is in that algorithm of treatment at some level now. Uh, and I, I think it should be something that should be considered. But again, very carefully, ketamine um, is, is a treatment that requires a large commitment from the patient in, in many ways. You can't drive the day you get it. It usually requires a few treatments a week for a few weeks. So this is a big commitment you're making. It's not, it's not a simple, you know, well, am I gonna, am I gonna try a, a course of Zoloft or something? This is, mm -hmm. So at the right point for the right patient, and at this point we typically consider it for treatment resistant depression, we've tried at least two good standard antidepressants for adequate dose, adequate duration. You've really given the standard oral antidepressants a good shot. I think ketamine is something, or in the version of S, ketamine, intranasal S, ketamine, something that really should be considered as a treatment option. Um, we're doing a large study with a few other academic sites comparing it to electroconvulsive therapy, the ECT, which is mm -hmm. still really the gold standard in our field. It's still thought to be the most effective treatment we have. Now, that mm -hmm. comes with its own baggage and its own you know, concerns yeah. and side effect, but right. still thought to be the most effective treatment. So if you look at it on that sort of spectrum, uh, you know, I think ketamine or esketamine has a real solid place in that spectrum. But you, you want to use it responsibly and at the right point for the right people. I think we'll leave it right there. I sure appreciate your time. It's a very, very interesting conversation. It's Dr. Gerard Santacora from the Yale University Depression Research Program. Thanks so much for sharing what you know. Thanks, Lee. It was a pleasure.